Arthur, King of the Britons, Defeater of the Saxons, Sovereign of all England, is mostly not those things. <gasps> when King Arthur is from is something of a matter of debate, alongside whether or not he existed, and as a proud Welshman, I'm going to say right at the top that this video kind of only works if we take our first conceit as Arthur existed, because otherwise the obvious answer is never, if you don't think he existed. Uh, but please don't click away because I'm poor and I need more views. <laughs> For real. Lots of people have sent me DMs on various platforms, people have asked me generally about King Arthur and about my opinion on Arthur, and I have lots of them. And this is going to be the first video that I make about him, and it's just going to focus on the when of Arthur, rather than the why, the how, and the ifs. Because I find this bit particularly interesting, because one of the things you'll notice if you watch historical dramas about Arthur is none of them seem to be able to agree when the hell he is from. For instance, in the glorious, blessed picture that is Monty Python and the Holy Grail, Arthur is dressed effectively in 14th century kit, although they didn't really knit chainmail in the 14th century. Cheeky. Whereas in Merlin, Arthur is impossible to date and purely fantasy. But then in this monstrosity, it's just offensive on every level, costuming aside. So what we're going to do is look at the first mention of Arthur that we have as a figure in history. And a lot of people think that it will involve things like the Battle of Baden Hill and the Saxon invasions of Britain. And you would be right. A lot of people also think that this will involve people like Gildas and the Venerable Bede. And you would be wrong. So the first place that we can sort of concentrate on is the Battle of Baden Hill, and some people say Baden, I don't because I know how to pronounce things, but the Battle of Baden Hill, Mons Badonicus, is mentioned in the 6th century monk Gildas, or Gweldas in Breton, um, his book De Excidio et Conquestu Britanniae, which is Latin for On the Ruin and Conquest of Britain, and he mentions the Battle of Baden Hill, Mons Badonicus, and he not only mentions it, he gives us a solid date for it and says that it was in the year 500, the year of his birth, calls it the greatest battle of our times, and then mentions uh, a load of kings of Britain, including some historical ones, uh, including Mylgun, or Mylgun Gwynedd, who was an historical king of Gwynedd, and also Vortipor. And you might have heard of Vortipor, or Gurthevir, as he's known in Welsh. He is a 6th century king of Dyved, which is here. And the De Excidio mentions the Battle of Baden Hill as a great victory against the Saxon invaders. It doesn't mention King Arthur. It's not clear who's leading the battle in Gildas's work. However, he does mention a man called Ambrosius Aurelianus. In Welsh, he's known as Emrys, Emrys Wletig. And he is a war leader. He's a, a post-Roman, a sub-Roman, a Romano-Briton who is effectively a war chief, leads men in battle, and he appears a lot later, and we're going to talk about him a little bit more, but he mentions him as being a great warrior, and that's it. There is no Arthur in Gildas. He doesn't mention him. Moving on then to the Venerable Bede's um, 731 magnum opus, the Historia Ecclesiastica Gentis Anglorum, the Ecclesiastical History of the English People, King Arthur's not mentioned in it. Why would he be? He wasn't English. This is a thing that I think we have to kind of get our heads around straight away, is the idea that Arthur was English. How could he possibly be English if his origin story is that he is a defeater of the Saxons and defender of the Britons? He cannot possibly be described as English. For a start, there is no England, and he's not fighting Angles, he is fighting Saxons, so he is just as anti-English as you could possibly imagine a person to be. The idea of Arthur as an English king is very much a later uh, co-opting of the legends by English writers and poets. It's really not based on any of the early information and any of the early sources that we have. So he's not in Bede, uh, although the Venerable Bede's work is definitely worth a read. It's really cool. You should read Bede. <laughs> I'm not even sorry. 
So Gildas does mention Ambrosius Aurelianus, but he doesn't specifically say that he's at the Battle of Baden Hill. There's kind of this idea that he just kind of says, oh yeah, and Ambrosius Aurelianus was this amazing leader. And then, some time after, the Saxons invade and are defeated at the Battle of Monspadonicus. But we're not sure. So we don't know when this Ambrosius guy existed. Bear him in mind, though. So Athir doesn't exist in Bede, he doesn't exist in Gildas. The first mention that we have of Arthur is by another monk called Nennius. Possibly. He appears in a text of around 829, so we're in the 9th century, and this text is ascribed to a Welsh monk called Nennius. Generally we think of Nennius as a, a monk, at least an ecclesiastic, and as a pupil of a man called Elvov, who is Bishop of Bangor, which is where I'm from. So Elvov is actually the guy who basically convinced the Welsh Church, or like, forced the Welsh Church, to use the Roman Catholic way of calculating the, de the date for Easter, the computus for Easter. And the Synod of Whitby in the 600s had actually already kind of decided that the Northumbrian Church and the English Church is... Uh, in various parts of what would be England, um, would use that technique. So Elvod was kind of like, guys, come on, we've got a better method. It's been 200 years now. Let's use the Latin. Let's use the Latin version, yeah? Yeah. So Nennius is a pupil of this guy, and he is um, somewhere in mid-Wales, uh, Radnor, Powys, kind of, somewhere in Powys. He's in Powys. And he apparently writes the Historia Britonum, the history of Britain, and he mentions Arthur. We have Arthur. There he is, in the book. And he mentions him being at the Battle of Mons Badonicus, the Battle of Baden Hill. And he doesn't mention him as a king, he doesn't mention him as an emperor of any kind. He calls him a Dux Bellorum. And Dux Bellorum is an old Roman title, which literally just means war leader. Just war leader, leader of battles, war leader. So he's not a king, he's some kind of general. He literally says in it, Arthur fought with the kings of the Britons against the Saxons. Arthur was Dux Bellorum. So he's not mentioned as a king, he's mentioned as fighting with these kings of the Britons, and that is, you know, whichever kings they may have been, there was also this guy called Arthur fighting with them as their war leader, which implies he was some kind of generalissimo, employed by the kings of the Britons, maybe? But we don't know. We have no idea. He doesn't say any more. That's it. He then goes on to list 12 other battles that Arthur fights, and these battles include his second, third, and fourth above another river called Dubglas in Linnaeus, and that's actually Lindsay, which is kind of southeast. Uh, the eighth is at the fortress of Gwynion, and this is where Arthur is said to have carried the image of the Virgin Mary, either on his shoulder or on his shield. And there's some confusion here that's been debated back and forth because the Welsh word for shield in this period is isquit and the Welsh word for shoulder is usquit. So there's this idea that maybe he was carrying like a flag, a banner with the Virgin Mary or like he, he had an icon of the Virgin Mary on his shoulders or he just had the Virgin Mary on his shield. I'm going to go with that one. And apparently the Saxons fled. The ninth is at the City of the Legion, Caer Leon, and Caer Leon is here, and it's called the City of the Legion because it has this, a Roman legionary fortress, which I think is pretty damn cool. So, Caer Leon, the City of the Legion, the Fortress of the Legion. So cool. We have the best place names. So, we have a mention of Arthur, and he is mentioned as Dux Bellorum, war leader. Fantastic. He's not a king. When does he become king? Well, we're getting to that. So... After this, we have the Annales Cambriae, which is the Annals of Wales, and it's uh, uh, basically a, a string of histories about what happened when. It sort of gives you a blow-by-blow, year-by-year, of the history of Wales. And it maybe is 10th century. It was compiled later, I think, in the 12th century. Editing Jimmy can confirm that or deny it. It talks about Arthur, and it talks about the Battle of Baden Hill. Battle of Mons Badonicus in Annales Cambriae, though, is given as 516, not 500, as it is in Nennius. So, it's the start of the 6th century, as far as we're concerned for this video, and it mentions Arthur, and it mentions Mordred, 
and it mentions Merlin. And it mentions that Arthur and Mordred fell at the Battle of Camlan in 537. If we go with this 10th century and with the uh, Gildas reference from the 6th century, the Battle of Mons Badonicus is somewhere around 500, 516, the first 20 years of the 6th century. Let's just go with that. So, if Arthur existed, it seems that he existed somewhere around the year 500 and something. He may or may not have died at a battle in 537 at Camlan with Mordred. He may not have had an acquaintance called Merlin. He may not have had... He may or may not have been linked in some way with Ambrosius Aurelianus. He's also not a king at this point. He's not a king. He is mentioned by some of the Bardic sources. So he's mentioned in the Battle of Catrith which sort of references a 300 Spartans trope, where we've literally got 300 Britons, 300 Welsh warriors fighting against thousands of Saxons, and they have a heroic, valiant death. Three of them survive, and the poet is one of them, who is then spreading the story after their deaths. Sound familiar? It's literally the story of the Battle of Thermopylae. It's literally the the movie 300, where the guy at the end has the eye patch on and he is telling the story of the Spartans. It's literally exactly the same, but from over a thousand years ago. It's amazing. We have these people slaying Saxons, feeding them to the Black Crows. Ah, but he was no Arthur. So we've got these people being compared to this legendary warrior, Arthur. Incidentally, these poems like um, Catrith and the poems of the Kinveirth Maybe 9th, 10th century. Some scholars are trying to prove them to be 7th century using letter forms and the language and the spellings. We don't know yet. We may never know. But they're early medieval, sub-Roman. They're early. They're over a thousand years old, almost certainly. Over a thousand years ago, Arthur is known as a great warrior. He's known as a leader of men. He is known as someone who fought at the Battle of Mons Badonicus. When does he become a king? Well, he becomes a king in the 12th century when Geoffrey of Monmouth gets his sticky fingers all over the, le the legends and just embellishes it all. He writes his pseudo-historical Historia Regum Britanniae, and it sucks. In 1136, it has a chapter on the prophecies of Merlin. He takes the story of the two dragons and Vortigern and just runs with it. Says that Ambrosius' real name was... Merlin, Merlinus, doesn't use the old Welsh form, Merdin. Uh, Merdin is where we get the modern Merthin, which is the Welsh for Merlin. Um, and he just he just takes it and runs with it. He says that Ambrosius succeed, is succeeded by Uther Pendragon because he seeds the head of a dragon, and his son is Arthur, who is king of the Britons. And this is in the 12th century. And he, he just... Pulls it out of his bum. He just pulls this stuff out of his ass and writes this huge pseudo-history and it effectively becomes a bestseller. And this is where we get stuff like the Mort d'Arthur. This is where we get the high medieval romances based around Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. This is where we get the fairy tale Arthur. But if we look at the old, old stuff, the Kinveir and the sources from before the Kinveir, we get a really interesting picture of Arthur not as this high medieval, plate armour wearing, dragon slaying, holy grail seeking git. But this post-Roman, Romano-British war leader. And in that period, in the post-Roman and the very early medieval, and the early, just the early medieval period, in Wales, to be a war leader is a very small hop, skip and a jump away from being a chieftain. Which is a very small jump away from being a king. Because in early medieval Wales, it's a lot more of a tribal system where you have family groups and extended family groups and royalty and nobility comes from being a member of that extended family group and leading your people in battle against other extended family groups to assert your dominance in your local area. That's a lot more how it works. So being a leader in battles, being a dux bellorum, is very, very easy to take that and go, leading, leading his men in battle against a Saxon invasion, must have been a king then. So there we go, Arthur. Did he exist? Yes, definitely. I'll fight you, IRL. What was he? 
we'll look into that in the next video I do in this series. I, I want to do more of this uh, Arthur stuff because I find it really interesting. But if Arthur existed, it seems likely that he existed somewhere around the end of the 5th into the 6th century. He may have been a war chief of a Romano-British tribe. He may have been some kind of highly experienced veteran warrior, cavalryman almost certainly, and he may have been chosen as war leader against the Saxons at one point, maybe at the Battle of Mons Badonicus. I like the idea that he was a little bit more rough and ready than the prim and proper Arthur with his nice crown and his plate armour and his round table so everybody gets a seat that we get in the high medieval stuff. I like the idea he was a bit more of a sleeping on the ground, fighting against Saxon invaders in his sort of late Roman, slightly antiquated armour and helmet in like a ridge helmet plated with gold, looking like an absolute legend. Looking like Bernadette's picture. That is what Arthur looks like to me. That is my Arthur, Dux Bellorum. I actually think I'm going to put this together as a reenactment impression. I'm going to do a historical Arthur with as much evidence from the period as I possibly can. And I'm going to try and make him, like, very late Roman slash sub-Roman. Because I think she smashed it out of the park on this one. And I can't believe how good a job she did. And I want to honour it by making it real in 3D. So, Bernadette, I'm going to make your Arthur come to life. And... Oh, I'm so excited. So thank you so much for watching. Thank you to all my patrons. If you are interested in supporting the channel financially, I have a coffee and I have a Patreon. And I have uh, a huge place in my heart for all of my generous patrons, especially the ones that I've met up with and had uh, a little drink with. So thank you very much, guys, for coming and saying hi. It's always a pleasure. Never a chore. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed this video. I will do more Arthur stuff. If you want me to do more Arthur, let me know in the comments. And if you think you have an alternative of when Arthur may have been, or you've got an idea of who Arthur may have been, based on the historical stuff, pop it in the comments. Love to see you guys chatting in the comments. It's so cool. So, I'm a minor. Thank you so much for joining. And as ever, till the next time, huil am a traw. Bye for now. Daffy English kniggets. Why would he have English kniggets? Why would he have English kniggets? He's not English, so his kniggets would be Britons. Right? He's king of the Britons. Who are the Britons? Yeah, that, that whole, who are the Britons? They're not Saxons, they're not English. They're Britons. Stupid. Stupid.